Welcome back, I'm Matt Chemist, and in today's important papers, we're going to be discussing some important transformations that you can do using ketals and acetals. To provide an overview, first we'll be discussing the Meanwell reaction, also known as the Meanwell nucleoside synthesis, where a dioxinone derived acetal can be converted into a wide range of non natural nucleosides. Then we'll be discussing the use of acetyl bromide to convert methyl acetals and ketals into the corresponding alpha bromomethyl ethers. And finally, we'll be discussing the Vassella reaction, also known as Vassella fragmentation, where zinc dust and sonication are used to convert a bromide or iodide to the corresponding alkene containing aldehydes through the ring opening of a pyranose or a furanose. Let's talk about the Meanwell reaction the use of a methyl acetal to build nucleosides. So this dioxinone-derived methyl acetal initially gets cyclized into an intermediate, which they're then able to open up using acetic anhydride to afford a wide range of nucleoside derivatives. This also affords a very convenient way to get a wide range of nucleosides in far fewer steps than was previously possible. The way that this works is initially you add a Grignard reagent to that dioxinone, such as methyl magnesium bromide. Once that Grignard reagent has been added, through the use of the Lewis acid TMS triflate in the presence of the base lutidine, also known as 2,6-dimethylpyridine, this acetonide then migrates to the corresponding alcohol over here, and one of the methoxy groups migrates, forming an oxonium. This oxonium can then be attacked by either of these two alcohols. In pathway A, we have the primary alcohol attacking, forming a cyclic acetal, which is also a methoxy pyran. Alternatively, if we have the tertiary alcohol attacking, we'll instead form a tetrahydrofuran, and this is an isolable byproduct which doesn't lead productively to the observed product 13. However, once you have the primary alcohol pyranose derivative, this is then able to react with another equivalent of the Lewis acid, which then forms another oxonium. This oxonium can then be attacked by the tertiary alcohol, forming product 13, which is the magic building block for this whole strategy. This strategy employs the use of a proline catalyzed aldol to set the stereochemistry of this corresponding aldol adduct, which, as you can see, affords product 6 in 94% in antimeric excess. It's then possible to add methyl magnesium bromide to this, forming the tertiary alcohol 10. Then, using various different conditions that they screened, which ultimately led to the use of two equivalents of TMS triflate, they're afforded with product 13. Then, using acetic anhydride in the presence of triethylsilyl triflate in dichloromethane, they're afforded with this peracetylated product 14. This product 14 can then be treated with TMS triflate yet again in the presence of a nucleobase such as thiamine, which then affords them with the nucleoside 15. They explored a wide range of different nucleobases in this paper, and if you'd like to see what they all look like, you can check that out using the link below. A wide range of different nucleobases both natural and non-natural were explored, including triazoles, pyrimidines, purines, imidazoles, and so on. You can see that a lot of heteroatoms are present in these, really highlighting the utility of this methodology. Nucleosides play an important role in antiviral therapy, so it's possible that one of these could get picked up and used for the development of new pharmaceuticals moving forward. In fact, not only can you add methyl groups in this methodology, they even explored ethyl, allyl, vinyl, and propargyl groups. And you can see even here they did some deuteromethyl groups, highlighting the value of this methodology. Now, exploring the utility of this methodology further, they were able to prepare some analogs of ribavirin, mizoribine, as well as this L-nucleoside analog, levovirin. This would just be done using the corresponding enantiomer of proline. Another cool thing that they showed is if you take this acetate containing furanose, it's possible to couple this with nickel mediated cross coupling using a vinyl iodide to afford product 41. So you're not just limited to nitrogen containing heterocycles, you can apply this to carbon carbon bond forming reactions also. If you're looking for a place to do research, I can't recommend doing research with Michael Meanwell enough. Dr. Michael Meanwell was a peer of mine during grad school, and he is one of the best chemists I've ever had the pleasure of working with. He's extremely creative, he's a very kind guy, and he has brilliant ideas that he pulls out of absolutely nowhere. He's not just an excellent chemist, he's an excellent guy, and one of the things that makes him an excellent guy is his excellent piano playing. Yes. 
This enticing music that you've been hearing playing is by none other than Michael Meanwell himself. So if you're looking to do a postdoc, Dr. Michael Meanwell has a position open at the moment, and he's always looking for new graduate students to join his research group. He's fairly early on in his career, so you want to get on the opportunity now while it's still available. If you do research with Mike, you will not be making a mistake. Take it from me. I don't give out endorsements very often, but in this case, it's absolutely worth it. The next topic that we'll be discussing is the use of acyl bromides to displace acetals. This can be useful for making new building blocks, which can then be coupled with cross-coupling chemistry or substitution with other nucleophiles. Although this has been known for over 100 years, this seems to be seldom applied in synthesis, which is why I found it important to cover in this video. In fact, it tolerates a wide range of functional groups, such as, in this case, we tolerate a ketone, where in other methodologies with acetyl bromide, you'd actually have reactivity with a ketone, as I'll mention at the end of this section. Here's another case where this dibromide is converted into the corresponding tribromide. It's then possible to eliminate this bromide using a strong base such as DBU or diisopropylamine to afford the corresponding vinyl bromide, which is also an allylic bromide. Furthermore, it's possible to apply this to benzylic positions, and there's a few different aromatic containing acetals which were explored in this paper from 1932. Aryl ketones were also tolerated, and in this instance you can see instead of a dimethyl acetal, a diethyl acetal was used. Here's an example where this chemistry was applied on a furanose derivative, which also contained a fluorine. So this is kind of an interesting motif. It's also possible to apply this to pyranoses. Here's a disaccharide with a troc group on it, and this was able to be converted selectively to the corresponding bromide. You might think that acetyl bromide could hydrolyze and react with all those different positions, but here you can see they got quite a good yield overall. Now, before I mention that acetyl bromide can also react with ketones, in the presence of Lewis acids, there's an equilibrium between the ketone and the corresponding bromoacetate. So here we have the bromoacetate adduct, and these can be isolated and columned, and occasionally you see them get used in cross-coupling chemistry. Although overall, this is still a really underutilized reaction, and you might be surprised to hear that acetyl bromide is actually able to react with a ketone. Believe it or not, zinc is a strong Lewis acid, strong enough to react to ketone with acetyl bromide. The third topic for today is the Vassella fragmentation, also known as the Vassella reaction. In this chemistry, we have zinc insertion into a carbon halide bond, which is usually bromine or iodine, resulting in the organozinc species, which will then eliminate the corresponding alkoxy group, ring opening the furanose or pyranose into the corresponding vinyl aldehydes. This can be useful as these cores are widely available in nature, and it's a good way to set the stereochemistry of the resulting alkene-containing aldehydes. Here's an example where we have the ring opening of this TBS-containing iodide to the corresponding aldehyde. Another example is shown here where we have an n bok group, which is tolerated with no issue. Here's a more complex example where we have a masked paramethoxybenzaldehyde group along with this o mom sem group, which was able to be ring opened without ring opening the other group. So this is kind of a cool example. In this case, we have the ring opening of a more complex scaffold into a tetrahydrosantonin derivative. Here we have a bromide ring opening. Instead of a methoxy, we have an acetate group, so this would liberate acetate as well, without ring opening this other lactone. Now, here's an interesting example where they took a thioether, they chlorinated it with n-chlorosuccinamide. So instead of a bromide or an iodide here, we have a chloride. And then upon cleavage with zinc, silver, and graphite, they were able to ring open this and form the corresponding vinyl sulfide as a mixture of diastereomers. Here's a couple different analogs that they explored this on, so you can see that this methodology is really applicable. The way that they end up putting that thiophenyl group on there is through treatment with tributylphosphine and diphenyl disulfide through a Mitsunobu-like reaction. This was then able to be used to prepare a number of complex compounds, such as these antibiotic analogs. Here's an example where agilostatin A was able to be prepared via this intermediate iodide-containing pyranose, while still retaining an o test group, a methyl carbamate group, as well as the silyl-containing amine-protecting group. 
the overall retrosynthesis is shown here. Another example is shown here where there's a fluorine containing pyranose, so you can make alpha fluorine containing aldehydes as well. Here's a case where we have a spirocyclic compound, which was a bromide. This is also open to the corresponding alkene. And I just really want to highlight here that this methodology is widely applicable. Here's one more example using a cyclic carbamate. And one last example is the elimination of this chloride on a steroid containing core. The way that this is drawn is a bit confusing, but if you just flip it around like 180 degrees, that's how we get from here to here. But the same methodology applies. The zinc inserts into the carbon chloride bond, this then eliminates the alpha alkoxy group, which affords an aldehyde. So this also works on cyclic systems. It doesn't just work on your typical pyranoses and furanoses. It can also work if you have a bridging pyranose or furanose. And this was reported in 1962. So this is not new chemistry. So it's quite surprising that we don't see it show up more often. Do you have bigger synthetic problems? Would you benefit from having a skilled organic chemist looking at your problems? Maybe you're working with a synthesis on demand company, a CDMO, or a CRO, and you could use some advice on how to tackle the roadblocks that you're encountering. Maybe you're trying to set up your own synthesis in-house, or maybe you need help drafting synthetic protocols. Just know that I'm one email away. Alternatively, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. So with that, I'd like to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great day.